Okay, we'll try it this way. Um, we are so glad to have each one of you here worshiping with us this morning, whether you are here because of the Academy kids, or whether you're our regular church family, or whether you're joining us online. We're so glad to have you as part of our worship this morning. And we especially welcome each one of you from the Academy as you share and make our worship so much more wonderful by you know, you're sharing your ministry of bells and music with us. Just a few announcements. Um, it's intriguing to me, we haven't finished this school year yet, even though we're winding it up, but you know we're already looking forward to next school year. I see here we have a kindergarten open house. If you know of youngsters who are approaching the age of kindergarten, we encourage you to invite them to be a part of our kindergarten open house. And then we also have academic showcase, which is a wonderful way to wrap up the school year, to affirm and encourage our kids with the things that they have been learning over the past year. Um, you will notice there is a guest potluck at the Fagels home this afternoon that you are welcome to join at 1.30. And just continued reminder that as a church, we are reading through the Bible. And just the other day, I realized, whoa, we're almost to the end of the Old Testament. Um, it has been a wonderful experience. So just encourage and affirm as we continue to receive that blessing. Uh, Nancy, if you want to share something else that's coming up. You know what a blessing it is when we come together. I would like to invite the ladies to join me for a blessing tomorrow. We are having a brunch from 9 a.m. to 11 at the multi-purpose room at the Niles Adventist School. Um, just so I have, kind of have an idea of how many are coming. If you think you're gonna be coming, could you just raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Okay, very good. Um, but you know, and I just want you to, you know, just come, relax. You know, I wanted this first um, event of the year to be one where we can just come together with ideas where you don't have to worry about anything. If you're running late and you come in your pajamas, I'm not going to complain. You know, just come as you are and, and uh, be part of the blessing. As we turn our hearts to worship, I was challenged by the first five work words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. There is enough in those five words to challenge us through eternity when we get to heaven. When you think about it, and I would like to paraphrase it, in our beginning, God created. Because God's eternal, way beyond what we can comprehend. And the fact that he created, in our humanness, we kind of like to think we create things. Like maybe I created a beautiful birthday cake. Oh, no, really, I actually stole all those ingredients from God because he created all those ingredients. Um, our pastor is creating a new house for his family. No, not really, pastor. You stole all those materials from God. <laughs> so the idea of what it really means for God to create, we rearrange things a bit, but we can't create anything. 
Um, I had a work friend once who the idea of an eternal God, the idea of eternity, it was so overwhelming that she just wanted to run away from it. But this morning, I encourage you, don't run away from an eternal God. Don't run away from a God who has the power to create, to create life, not just rearrange things. Don't run away. Run to that kind of a God. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. Open our hearts to what it really means that in our beginning, God, that in our beginning, you already existed, that you exist beyond our comprehension from eternity to eternity. We worship you as our creator, again, beyond our comprehension, the power that in seven days you created everything we see. Father, we worship you this morning. Open our hearts to your spirit that you want to pour out on us this morning. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please stand for our opening song. I would invite you and join me for the morning prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome privilege that we have to come to you. Father, I think of those that we have lost from our church family so recently. Um, Nancy Rader, Max Rusher, both of which have been a part of this church family for many, many, many years. Father, we're so thankful that death does not have the final word, but that you, our creator, who gave the gift of life, will give that gift back again. That death doesn't have the final word. That as these two have been laid to rest, that they have a hope that you are coming again and that we will join them in the air to see you and we just praise you and look forward to that day. We also think of Heather Baldwin's family as they've lost an aunt. I just pray that you would embrace each one of these families 
with your peace, with your hope, and that you will bless and embrace them with your love. Father, this morning I know that each one that has come comes with something special on their heart, whether it's a praise, whether it's a petition. Father, we all need you, and we know that you are more than enough to provide for all our needs, and we just open our hands to accept that blessing here this morning. Father, as we worship together, we pray that your Holy Spirit would um, anoint our hearts. Father, we need forgiveness. We need the blood of Jesus, with righteousness of Jesus to cover us. Because we know this past week, each one of us has had sin in our hearts in one way or the other. And so we just pray for that cleansing, healing blood of Jesus to provide what we need here this morning. And Father, we pray that you would continue to bless this church as we answer your call to be a witness into this community. And we pray that you would bless our worship this morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. As we view a video on child impact, our deacons will be picking up our morning offering.
and there was only a couple Adams kids here. There are other French students at the dance school, but most come from Indian backgrounds. There's a couple of Muslim students, but the parents don't mind sending their kids here because they know that the quality of education is so high. Uh, in the villages, they have this uh, feeling that these children may be born there because of their parents' sin. Uh, when we go for house visiting, they say, oh, it's because of our sin, our children don't like this. But when the children are here, and then for holidays, when they go back home, should see the neighbors, and they say, no, oh, we thought this child, now she can write in English. These children are communicating in English. We wish our children can come to your school and study. So our children are getting good education and good character. When they leave from here, uh, they go with a lot of confidence to face the world. Our teachers open up their minds and say, you know, you can achieve whatever you dream. If you work for it, you want to be a doctor, you can do it. If you want to be an engineer, you can do it. Even if you want to be a teacher, you can do it. And I'm proud to say that we have had some students who studied here, three of them, who are in the teaching field. Two of them are interpreters in the school, and one is working in a deaf school. And I'm so glad. Yes, you can do what you want to do if you just try to work. And I believe that every dream that the children have, they can achieve it with hard work and with God's Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, we're so glad to be here. We are in Green Sound. Our Campbell's choir. Thank you. I was trying my, you know, teaching voice. So yeah, Mike, it's gonna be better. So we're so glad to be here. I, as far as I remember, the last time I came here with one of my. Andrews Academy Ensembles, I think it was four or five years ago, we came here with uh, my choir. It was such a blessing. This is such a welcoming church, a church that loves music. So we are really happy to be here. We will play uh, now two pieces. The first one is an arrangement of the hymn, He Leadeth Me, with a kind of a calypso kind of rhythm. And afterwards, we will play uh, Crown Him with Many Crowns. I hope you'll be blessed by those messages. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Martins, for bringing your wonderful ensemble here, the Bell Choir. It was a great blessing to hear you praising God. I know that you were supposed to be here about 8 in the morning, right? Yeah, well, we are very grateful to uh, have such a wonderful addition to our worship service. I didn't know that spinning around also is a part of that. Yeah, I do that once and I forget all of my sermons, so uh, they kept on going. It's great. You impressed me this morning. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, also am very thankful to all of the uh, parents and grandparents that have uh, come here to support uh, the students in uh, praising God. You know, anytime a group of young people that get together to, uh, with one purpose, to glorify the name of our God, it's always a great blessing. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. We continue our journey uh, through uh, the Bible, reading the Bible, and uh, this week we had three books to read. They are not the longest uh, uh, Old Testament books. They are Joel, Amos, and uh, Obadiah. Uh, that is something uh, that uh, was uh, doable as a uh, accomplishment uh, it was uh, it's going to be even easier next week because next week we only have a book of Jonah that is a few chapters to read and uh, what I do when I have a book of Jonah to read I read it once and then I do it again again and that's what's going to happen next week but for right now we are and the, uh, these three books and specifically my message is going to be from my book of Joel Late one July morning in um, uh, 1874, a 12-year-old uh, farm girl, Lily Marks, uh, she watched the sunlight dim and a peculiar darkness sweep over the Kansas sky, and it was a wearing, rasping sound followed, and as uh, uh, people lifted their heads up, they saw that the sky was covered with some sort of a snowflakes that were kind of dark, they were moving, they were making a sound, and a moving gray-green screen between the sun and earth have covered that uh, day, um, not just that state, but quite a few states at the same time. Uh, then something dropped from the uh, cloud like a hail, hitting the uh, family houses, trees, and fences, and a child in Jefferson County, Kansas, who had gone out at the midday to draw water from the well, exclaimed, this was his uh, statement, there, here, the sky is full of them, the whole yard is crawling with this nasty things, okay, so... Uh, the um, uh, people were witnessing a massive invasion of, uh, of this kind of species, uh, what we know as uh, Rocky Mountain locusts, uh, but they call them grasshoppers, huge grasshoppers. They invaded um, Dakota uh, Territory, also Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, and the present-day Oklahoma and Texas. Just imagine uh, the invasion uh, of the species that come and eat everything on their way. Farmers ran uh, to cover uh, the wells, uh, everything, um, at least uh, anything to save from these nasty things, and uh, that's pretty much all they could say, uh, save because this nasty thing would literally eat everything, the paint, uh, the building material, uh, the plants, and they would live a devastating picture behind. The crops were gone, and uh, these uh, farmers were looking at the in, um, invasion as something that would ruin uh, their lives, and so it was. Many of the farmers uh, couldn't make it through the next year. It was uh, something else, and now that's what, what the farmers were saying. They ate everything but the mortgage, you know, so that's something they had to deal with. The farmers were devastated by this invasion of locusts, but 
God will give them victory soon. Stay with us and you will find what the answer God uh, had for this invasion later. But uh, today we will uh, focus on our topic uh, for today, that is uh, choosing the right side. By the way, yeah, that's one of the pictures how farmers viewed this invasion. Okay, choosing the right side. Book of Joel, I call it the book of Locus because this is what uh, uh, one of the main messages was of a prophet to God's people that please repent, otherwise God will have to bring um, the repentance into your heart by some devastating events like Locus. A brief introduction to the book of Joel lacks the important elements present in most of the other books where in the other books we have the title of the book, we have the prophet's name, we have the time frame when the prophet was prophesying, and we know exactly what the message was. Over here, nothing is said of a prophet uh, except for his father's name. Nothing is said about the content of a message. We have a book with no clues on dating, no information about the prophets or his family, no indication where Joel prophesied. One thing we have, though, for sure, that is the word of God came to God's people, and God's people was supposed to respond to that. You know, this is what uh, the uh, book uh, is uh, starting with, the word of the Lord. Um, the word of God came to the prophet, and this statement occurs in the Bible uh, for 234 times, and most of these times, 136, they are found in the books of prophets. Greater prophets, minor prophets combined, they have most of this phrase. And when uh, this phrase starts, usually follows the message from a living God to God's people, and God's people are supposed to respond to the call of God. The prophet did not call upon any personal qualifications or training. He simply felt impressed by God to come to his people and share with them a very vital information. And Joel, the name of Joel means uh, that God is, um, uh, that, that the Lord is God. Joel was the man of God who sent uh, was sent by God to uh, tell the people of God the message of devastation. Please repent, otherwise the devastating um, uh, things will happen to you. Repent before the trouble is coming. I have known only few prophets, though, that whose uh, advice was listened and whose warnings were not ignored. Reading the Bible, you can count how many people have responded to the prophet's uh, call. For instance, uh, we remember that Nathan, the prophet, came to King David and he prophesied and he uh, uh, shared with him a story, a parable, and David was uh, rebuked by the prophet. David repented as a result. There's just unusual response. Usually, when the prophets of God come to God's people with a word of warning. There's no response whatsoever. Actually, the opposite effect is happening. The prophets are being persecuted, put in jail, killed, and destroyed. So uh, anytime, this is what the pattern, what I figured out in the Word of God. If you see that the prophet would come to uh, people and would share with them a word of warning, and if there's going to be a repentance as a result, those people usually are not the people of God. They are the Gentiles, so-called people uh, that uh, the Israelites, that God's people did not appreciate and did not um, uh, count them as uh, people at all. Thus, Nineveh listened to the sermon of Jonah. Jonah uh, came and um, just talked to uh, Nineveh for about few, uh, uh, in about few sentences, the entire city was converted. And also, reading in the Old Testament and New Testament, we'll see like people like Ruth, Rehab, Naaman, together with all of the New Testament Gentiles, they have created a positive response to the message of God. When God's people, in return, did not um, uh, give this uh, positive answer to God. 
Well, let's remember the simple uh, rule of all. You know, when uh, <clears throat> we are all sinners, right? That's what the Word of God says. Everybody is a sinner, and we know that. Everybody is prone to make mistakes. We all do mistakes. Not the mistakes are the problem, but how do we respond to those mistakes? That's what makes us sinners or the people of God. God's people, when they fail, when they make a mistake, they do not have a problem coming with that mistake to God and say, I'm sorry, please do something with it. Because we cannot change anything. When we fail, there's nothing we can do but come to God and ask for forgiveness and ask that God would fix the situation. And that's what God does. He says, my son, my daughter, I hear your voice. Come to me, give me your problem. Here is my solution for you. And there's another group of people that when they fail, when they make a mistake, they don't even bother going to God. They don't even bother feeling sorry for they have done what they have done. Or maybe if they feel sorry, they choose not to come to God and ask Him for His help. So why were the prophets in their majority ignored? Why was it that uh, when the people of God would hear the message from God, they would, not cre uh, they would not bring the good fruit of repentance? John the Baptist uh, came to God's people right before the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as you know, the result of his ministry was among the simple people, those that were not not among the elite, the Pharisees, the scribes, those the learned people, they choose not to re create the good fruit of repentance. They did not feel the need in repentance. And uh, the people that uh, they were humiliated the most, the sinners, the tax collectors, uh, the warriors, the uh, soldiers, they would come and would ask God to change, transform their lives. I would like to share with you a personal testimony because uh, it's not a testimony, it's more a story of uh, how I figured out, I realized why is it so difficult to repent. You know, I practiced judo, and uh, you know, uh, it was a time about six years ago when I decided to make a, kind of an interesting thing. I decided to uh, go and compete, you know, being a little bit older in age to go and compete. Um, it was actually a division, they called it masters division. It was because of age, uh, you know, I would fall in that category. And then I found out that actually that, that not many crazy people to compete in that division. So uh, we were moved a division to compete with all of the young people. It was a big mistake. But about that, I will talk later. To be ready to qualify in the tournament, I had to lose weight. And I always envied people that can eat anything and anyhow and never gain weight. I always envied that because I gain weight just by watching at the food, you know. It's not fair, I know. Have you ever seen the people that could eat anything, never gain weight? I've seen that. That's not fair. Do you agree with that? Yeah, not fair. So my goal was, oh boy, I need to lose at least 10 pounds now, because if you do not, then you get into a weight category that is grayed up, and that, that's some beasts over there. You don't want to do that. <laughs> so I said, okay, fair enough, I can do that. So I started uh, doing the exercise, I was watching what I was eating, and in uh, meanwhile, you know, there was a, a friend of mine, a scales, right, that help you monitor the progress and see um, how much you've lost and uh, uh, where, is, uh, where you were uh, at towards your goal. And so I felt pretty good because the scale was telling me that I'm making really good progress. So. Um, my wife, though, Olena, she started being very suspicious of my progress, you know, so uh, she decided to go and buy another scale, 
and just to check if this scale is showing the right thing. And I felt that trouble is on, at the door because when she unpacked and laid it on the floor and sure enough, the old scales were showing that I weighed five pounds less than actually the new scales. And guess what scales I like the best? I like the old scales, and I was, now we had a debate, which one is right? I was saying no, the old one is right, and no, the, the new one looked like more like this, sophisticated digital, and I said no, no, the, the old one is right. So we finally found one in the basement, the third scale, and uh, it was uh, probably from the times of Roman Empire, who probably looked like this something, and, and yeah, it proved that the new scales are showing the right weight, and the old one is uh, fooling me by at least five pounds. I was devastated. I did not want to hear the truth. Do you agree with that? I thought I was doing great, you know, but in reality, not really, not really, but I did not want to hear the truth. And it was just about weight, my friends. What if? What if the matter that we are dealing with is something else, is something deeper than that? If God is pointing in the area in our lives that is a troublesome, let's say we have hard times forgiving somebody. Uh, let's say we uh, have wronged someone and have hard times accepting that and asking for forgiveness. What if uh, uh, there's a group of people that we do not like? Uh, what if, what if you name it? What if the problem is deeper than just your weight, and yet you don't want to hear the truth? You would like to listen to the prophets that um, just appease your uh, ears, that uh, tell you the things that you like to hear, but not what the truth is all about. You know, this is what realized, this is when I realized that's why probably God's people in their majority would choose not to follow the messenger of God. Uh, they would choose to do away with the truth by uh, killing the prophets, beating them, uh, putting them in prison. And Joel is one of those prophets that comes to God's people and says, please, God's people, repent, for the trouble is at the door. It's now the best time to, uh, to, for a change in your life. And people of Israel, as well as we are, have been made from the same material uh, because we all do wrong things and uh, they have chosen to do away with the messenger, pretty much like I did away with the good scales. I put them in the basement, you know, so. Uh, God in his mercy is able to make us righteous when we come to him and ask for a change. Uh, and if we choose uh, not to follow Jesus, then we stay with our own mistakes. Then those mistakes sooner or later will ruin our lives. You know, it's very unfortunate, but that's true. Uh, the bald eagles, um, they uh, tend to uh, hunt in the winter time. They, they are going fishing at the lake at the, when the water is freezing. And uh, they do not have a good pace of uh, timing how much time they can spend uh, next to the uh, freezing water. If, let's say, would catch a prey, would put it on ice, and would start eating in that, if they spend too much time on that ice, what's going to happen to them? They're going to freeze. And this is the picture taken in 2019 in uh, Michigan. Uh, and as you see over there, there's a... Okay, let me see a, a, a little better picture, yep. Uh, one of the volunteers, Ken Scott, he is the one that gets called when somebody observes a, a picture like that, an eagle stuck on the ice. Um, uh, some passing by people in Michigan, they saw on the lake four eagles uh, eating something on ice, and three of them took off, the fourth one stayed. And they figured out there's some problems over there. They called Ken Scott. Ken Scott came over, and there's a, uh, there he is in the picture. When he was able to come and 
Hopefully for this bird, he was able to rescue that bird by cutting, splitting the uh, piece of ice together with that bird and taking him to a warmer place where uh, the ice melted and the bird was set free. But how many times that didn't end in, in the situations like that, when the eagle would just hang on to its prey and then freeze to death where um, uh, he was eating that prey. And my friends, the same way happens to us when we hang on to something that God doesn't want us to. The problem, if we don't let it go, if we don't bring it to God, that same problem will ruin our lives. And God doesn't want that to happen. So he keeps calling, please repent, come to me, bring me your problem. Don't stay with it in your hands. Bring it on to me and I will take care of your problem. I will make you uh, whole. Uh, you know, Joel was dealing with... Um, a nationwide tragedy when not just one family, but all of a nation have chosen wrong gods to follow. Uh, they would worship idols. They would um, just implement uh, in their own lives those uh, um, cults uh, that uh, people that were surrounding them were worshiping, and um, it turned their hearts away from the Lord. So Joel calls first to the priests with the advice. That's what he says in Joel chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles, please open and follow, uh, because I don't know if you would be able to read um, um, all the verses off the screen. That's what the Word of God says. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, uh, lay all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are uh, withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And then Joel has a message for God's people, not just for the priests. In this next passage, Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, that's what he says to God's people now. Therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful verse uh, here. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, <clears throat> and of great kindness. He relents from doing harm. The safest place in this universe, my friends, is at the hands of mercy of our God and Savior. Amen? That's the safest place to be. That's what prophets tell to God's people. Please come. Do not be afraid of those loving hands. We know also that those loving hands are pierced. For our salvation. We know there's a price paid for our forgiveness. We know that. However, when we go wrong ways, we have a tendency to be afraid to come back to those loving hands and ask for forgiveness. Uh, you know, in his book, When Christ Comes, Max Licada introduces us to his daughter, Sarah, and uh, her friend, uh, pet hamster. You know, one day Max uh, uh, was in charge and uh, he uh, let out that uh, little hamster uh, to just roam around the room and that little hamster got on the piano and uh, right uh, got right inside of that piano and uh, you could hear him play different notes as he was running down the strings over there. Um, but the problem was he didn't know the way out and uh, the uh, two people involved Sarah and her dad, Max, were trying to extract that little hamster out of a piano. It was a very difficult thing to do because there's almost no room to go and grab that little hamster and pull him out of the trouble. That creature was terrified, that scared, and he got himself into one of the corners of that piano. 
And whatever they tried, they tried different strategies. So they uh, first tried with a nice, soothing voice to call the pet, no answer, and then they tried like with a bullying voice of a surgeon, you know, didn't work. They tried to play some mild notes, maybe that will just somehow move him out. No, it didn't work, and then they just tried the different way. Nothing worked out, and finally, the strategy was chosen. Okay, the Phillips screw, let's just dismantle the piano. That was the answer to the problem, my friends. And then Max was saying in his, uh, uh, in his thought, in his... Uh, uh, book that now we are both trapped, Fred the hamster by Piana, and uh, we also are trapped by guilt, anxiety, and pride. We too now live in a foreign, fearful place where we never meant to be, and our master's hand is near to help, is right there, but we are still afraid to respond to the invitation of those loving hands and we still sit in a corner being scared and afraid, destroyed by guilt and anxiety. Like Fred, we ignore our only source to, for help and <clears throat> hope. God calls for us and he is calling softly um, or he is screaming whatever God tries. Unfortunately, for some people, it never works, but there is hope that today is going to be a different response from your heart to the heart of God. And that is only what you can do. The title for today is Choosing the Right Side. My friends, you are the ones that make this choice. Today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, right now in this moment, we are choosing the right or the wrong side, but my my request, my prayer for you, that you would choose the right side. You know, God tries different strategies to work in our lives. He is calling us with a mild voice. But then if when it doesn't work, He is warning us. And He is screaming at, uh, you know, at times at us like He did with the nation of Israel by sending locusts uh, that were invading their place. They were eating everything in their country just to get their attention and tell, my people, please, Repent, turn your hearts to me. God is doing the same in our own lives. And I praise God when anything out of those strategies works and we turn our hearts to God. You know, the book of Joel is full of uh, uh, wonderful messages. And <clears throat> let's see, um, I would like us to compare a few uh, scripture passages right now. Some of them would be from the book of Joel, and some would be from elsewhere in the Bible. And I would like you to pay close attention to those passages and see if you have, uh, if you have been able to uh, see some similarities, something in common. In, in common. So first passage, uh, Joel chapter two, verses one and two. Uh, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, a day of darkness and uh, gloominess, a day of clouds and thick, thick darkness, um, like the <clears throat> morning clouds spread over the mountains. And uh, then the same chapter, chapter 2, we have verses 30 through uh, 32. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth for blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of great and awesome day of the Lord. It, it, and uh, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. For in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be what? Deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So that is a description 
of the day of the Lord. Let's read another passage that is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sun, uh, the sign of the uh, um, Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. Okay, and now this is the uh, last passage I would like you to read, and that is found in the book of Revelation. It's one of my favorite books that tells us about the end times. And verse uh, uh, 12 of uh, through for, verses 12 through uh, 14 in chapter 6. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great what? Earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell uh, to the earth, and the fig tree drops uh, its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Uh, Monday, right? It's going to be the uh, eclipse. Everybody is waiting for that. They buy special devices. Oh, maybe I'll be able to see that. My friends, when the day of the Lord is coming, everybody will know it's the day of the Lord. Everybody will be able to see the darkness where it's supposed to be light. Everybody will be able to see as it described that the moon turns into um, blood. And this is what God is telling the day of the Lord uh, is coming when <clears throat> I will bring all people to the judgment. So, my friends, do whatever you want in your life. But remember that the day of the Lord is at hand. And there's only going to be two groups of people in that day. As the passages that we read described as the situation, there will be one group of people that, that when they would see the day of the Lord, they would mourn. They did not expect that day to happen. They lived their lives to their own pleasure, but there will be one group of people that would rejoice when all of these calamities would take place. And this would be God's people, for they know their deliverance is near. You are the ones that choose today what group to belong. That choice, you're not going to make that day. It will be too late. Now is when you choose the right or the wrong side. God promises his people that the day will come when the earth will almost perish, but those who fear the Lord should not fear that day, but in the opposite, they would rejoice in the Lord. Those who are waiting for the Lord and those who did not uh, uh, expect him, these are two different groups of people, and the only difference in between them is, by the way, both of them are sinners. Both groups are sinners, but one group, they have repented at the voice of God. And the other did not listen to the voice, soft voice of God. You know, the recipient of a message in the book of Joel was the people of Israel. And I would say both kingdoms, northern and the southern, they were God's people. They were supposed to listen to the words of Joel and respond with repentance. In Matthew chapter 24, if you remember, who was the recipient of the message in the book of Matthew chapter 24 when they were listening about the signs of the end of times? If you would go into the beginning, very beginning of chapter 24, you will find out that the disciples of Christ surrounded Jesus and they asked Jesus, would you please tell us about the signs of the end of the days, about the day of the Lord? And to his disciples, Jesus is telling all of his symptoms when you know that the day of the Lord is at hand. And then in the book of Revelation, by the way, 
so-called the sealed book, but it's called the book of Revelation. That book is for God's people, a message to God's people. So in all three occasions, the message was given to God's people, please repent. So the call for repentance is not for somebody at the street, but for somebody that is already inside of the church. It's for you and me. But the problem of all times was that we think we are just too good. We don't need any repentance. It was a problem with Pharisees, and it could be a problem with us. Seventh-day Adventists living in the 21st century thinking that the call for repentance is for your neighbor, but not for you. And that is one of the most devastating mistakes that God's people could ever do. Joel is trying to affirm the message and say, please do not fall into that trap. This call is for us to repent. It's because when I read the Bible, I see that before uh, heaven, uh, we need to ask for repentance and uh, forget about our own righteousness. That's what the Word of God says, especially in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus is talking to his own people and he says, I am at your door. If you open, I will come in and dine with you. And before that, he describes what a wretched condition we are in. We think we are rich. We think we have no need in anything. And at the same time, we are so poor. And in the book of Joel, uh, verse 17, verses 17 through 19 in chapter 2, uh, that is the a call um, of God to God's people. Uh, let the priests who minister to the Lord. Okay, let me see. Let me go back. Okay. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for uh, his hand, for his land and pity his people, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. That is what God is telling. Just repent, and I will reverse all the bad things that you have in your life. Just give me your heart. Uh, the text along with Revelation chapter 3 will reveal us that at the moment we repent, we become the winners in the kingdom of God. How does that work? I do not know, but that is true. When we repent, we become the winners. When we confess to the Lord what we have done and ask for a change and transformation, that's when we become winners. It's illogical in our view to admit our own mistakes. And that's uh, what Philip Yancey is uh, writing in his book about this illogical math that works in grace. And that's what he says. It's absurdity of a gospel. Uh, one sheep is more important than 99. Does that make any sense? Well, not in common sense. A widow's mite is more valuable than the rich donor's millions. A one our worker being paid the same as the person who labored for 12 hours, a year's wages of perfume poured over a man that would die is a valuable thing in the eyes of God. How does that work? We don't know. That's the mystery of God's grace. But my friends, let God be God. Let him be the best of what he is able to do, and that is take our broken lives and mold them into his likeness. Let him do that. He is best at that. And that's what the promise comes in the book of Joel, chapter 2, 25 through 27. So I will restore 
to you the years uh, that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. And verse 27, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. When we come to God with our shame, God says, I'll take it away from you, and you shall never be put to shame. Amen? That's the gospel message, my friends. That's what we ought to spread around and tell how wonderful is our God. God will forgive us. All we need is just repent. And by the way, didn't you notice all my uh, later sermons, all I talk is about repentance. Why? Why repentance? My friends, because that's in the Bible. Really, I don't take anything out of my own uh, interpretation and understanding. This is the core message of every single prophet. God is calling his people for repentance. So coming back to the situation uh, with farmers in 1874. I promised I'll give you uh, this uh, rest of the story. In 1874, that invasion took place and it started many years of devastating um, uh, famine when this locust would come, would eat everything on their way and uh, the farmers would go bankrupt. But this is amazing thing that happened. Farmers didn't even know, but they had done away with this locust themselves. They didn't know. They did it by accident. They saw some of the lands in the Rocky Mountains that they saw they were good for, uh, um, uh, you know, bringing crops. So they irrigated that land and they basically put water into the ground that was full with the eggs of these insects. And this is how eventually by 19... 1890, they were done away with that invasion. They didn't even know that. My friends, if you give your heart to God, the same sin that is afflicting you today, God will make a monument of his victory. Whatever it is, if you think it's that great, just bring it to God and see what great God can do with your life. That same thing that is going after you, God will take it away from you and then he will send you back to your friends, to the people around you, and that you then will tell others how great and mighty is the God that can save like this. This is the message of the book of Joel. This is the message of the book of Matthew and the Revelation. It is all for us to decide what side we want to be on. If you repent and give your life into the hands of God, you will win. And if not, if you hang on to your own sin, to your own problem, you will perish. But God does not want that to happen. Amen.
Amen. Let's bow our heads for benediction. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for your messengers that are sent to us to prepare us for the great day of the Lord that is coming. Lord, please help us to hear your voice and not run from your loving hands, but accept the message from you and repent. Please come into our hearts and lives, change them, transform them according to your understanding. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.